Hello, this is Armin Kajoyan. You all are in my studio here in Jackson Heights, Queens, New York City. My career as an artist, designer, and illustrator for approximately 40, 50 years. Say to go back to my early years as a kid, I five, six years old, that I, w I would be preoccupied good parts of my day uh, drawing, drawing on the floor with crayons, paper, newsprint paper. You know, at a young age, I, I had the vehicle to live in a fantasy world, which uh, I'm sure a lot of young kids do, but this was just a, you know, artwork was just a greater access to that fantasy world. This piece, you have to see, this is one of my earliest paintings. I must have been 10, 9 years old. I had to get, come up here and take a look at that. That was from my first art lesson, third or fourth attempt at painting. Yeah, and I love seascapes because, you know, growing up in New England, we were always around the ocean. And then when I got to high school, junior high, I, you know, you, your interests start to evolve and in high school I got involved in sports and dad was a coach in my high school so when I went to college I didn't go as a fine art major, I had no intention to be a fine artist. You know, I went to college to play sports, football primarily, and I thought that I would stay in college and be a grad assistant and coach. but. My path took me a different way. I applied for graduate school to get my MFA, and my portfolio work was good enough. And we had some great influential teachers. After graduation, that was a weird time in the country. Unemployment levels were very high. Art schools then didn't prepare you for the job world. And it was really, a hard slog to pursue my way to some kind of substantial career. I knew I wanted to be in the art world, but I didn't know where, where the breaks would come. Started in doing mechanicals for pre-press work and a little shop somewhere in Boston that lasted two weeks. They said I didn't work fast enough at that time. Of course, I didn't know what I was doing. But then it was a few more months, I'm looking around, and I end up getting a job at a place in Harvard Square called uh, Stats For You. And I was in the dark room, and I picked up a lot of language and camera techniques, and we were making something that's obsolete now. It was called a photostat. And, and I, used, I was a master on the, a machine that you use with the crank handles. It was called an Agfa Gevhart. Uh, like a flatbed machine that you would put your images on to convert to uh, screens for printing press. Or we would do 3D shots on this machine. And that, you know, I did that for about four or five months, then got bored, started applying to graphic design jobs because I had a different kind of portfolio and I picked up the language of graphic design. So I probably went on a couple dozen interviews with no luck at all. Got a response back from a publisher in Boston called Allen and Bacon. They tr they trained me very well. It was as, if not better than a college education um, to the graphic design business and book building and the in the craft of book design and the and the craft of book production. This was a tissue design of a book cover. I'm glad I kept this because this because. Yeah, I'm glad I kept this because this is how work was done before there was a computer. So this is how I designed a book cover. And then I have little notes for the illustrator. And the illustrator is a fantastic guy. His name is Roy Weeman. He's, you can find his work on the internet. Really incredible. So this is how they did it back in the day. Yeah, back in the day. And this is his work. So what I've envisioned, and I literally got this idea right after the meeting of the, of the launch of the book, and you know, under that pressure that we had, you had to get your design ideas quick. So this I had the idea of uh, splitting the globe, so when you close the book, you actually got the feel of a whole globe. So when you carried it like this, 
this was the feel. I love that. It just came came to me. In and the this air. was the original design. Of that's that's the original to get approved by the editors because when you hired an illustrator at this level, his his work was like I think that was eighteen hundred for that illustration, nineteen nineties. So that opened up many doors that really sustained me for close to forty some years and eventually brought me to New York City to work as a designer for many publishers. And as an offshoot of that, I saw how great illustrators come into the publishing houses and I said, well, I can do that myself. So I had a lot of success at that as well. Okay, these, this actually was one of uh, the pieces from my very first show in uh, Espresso 77, Gallery 77. It's just a oil wash, and then I worked in on it with oil pastels, oil bars. This was the second or third piece my mom did in uh, art lessons, the same art lessons I was taking with the same lady. She's and this somebody, uh, an artist in Massachusetts, did that on my mother. Very nice picture. That looked just like a nice picture. Always after work, I would try to paint. But work would be so much and so stressful, such a great volume of work that, you know, I could paint for three, four months with good strength. But after, after that, you know, working around the clock, not sleeping, because I usually would paint from nine to two in the morning. I, um, found that I would stop painting. So I was just focusing on my design work. So it was a constant battle, paying your bills and pursuing your art. And that kind of brings me up to where I am now, where I just want to see if I can dedicate all my time to making art. You know, I, I tend to vacillate more to the uh, ab abstraction or organic abstraction or figurative abstraction work. There seems to be more level of uh, uh, question and investigation. It's immediate and abstract work where I didn't get that in representational work where you know you you almost are becoming a slave to your technique and it gets boring and you know you start looking at the clock, particularly with illustration for clients. You're up against a deadline. You have to have a style that's quick abstract work sense of total freedom you, you know you are uh, you literally falling into a different world there you go that's pretty good and then i just have this little wire antenna the uh reality of being uh, an artist in new york city is not the uh success stories that the media likes to portray where you know somebody comes to the city and like a like a Basquiat or a Keith Haring those are very rare very unique stories uh, for every person that's like them there's probably a thousand to two thousand people that are struggling and that and that's true of all the arts here in the city uh, you know, dance, acting, writing, music. Space is, space is vital in New York to become a successful artist, actually a physical painting artist, because once you start uh, producing a lot of work, that w unless that work is selling and you have a way to store it, that work is gonna push you out of your apartment. I'm starting to get pushed out of my apartment. So there's other artists a little more productive than me that I've been in their studios and they've, they've worked so much, have so much work that they literally, this is all the space they have, they're sitting around here. I know one particular artist in Long Island City that had to give up his studio because he, because he had so much work, so many stacks of paintings that uh, he was forced out and it's crimped his ability to produce. So I have bigger, bigger pieces. They're all hidden in uh, the wooden shipping crate. That, that's a crate I ship artwork to Art Basel in Miami. Uh, big 
pieces there, all those tubes and big pieces of uh, artwork that I did in Brooklyn rolled up on archival paper. But once these paintings come out and occupy 50% of the room, I'll be back to working on paper, uh, and I will need to find a bigger studio. I told you my work vacillates from the abstract to the to the uh, representational. So you can kind of see how that affects the recent pieces I'm doing, but uh, I'm, I'm just moving more and more to the abstraction. Organic, I call it organic abstraction, because all my abstraction has recognizable forms, shapes, but I'm not really defining them to be such. You know, this obviously is, a, is you know, it's humanoid, it's a head, but it's an abstraction. I call this pineal boy. That's the enlightened pineal gland. These, these pieces, you know, I can do these quick, but the energy one that's contained in these, my hand motion, my arm, I love to work big. I love to have big motion moving, all constant movement. But there's nothing that says my movement should stop here. I can fill this wall with a painting every week if I had the, 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 the space or the means to do it, but I don't, you know, where am I going to put them? I don't have the space, so I, I've got to get the space. That's goal number one, is to get the space, because it's, and actually you see more things when you're working bigger. But I'm also trying to be a conduit for the energy and imagery that's coming to me. Because it, it is a form of energy that's, that's coming out. It comes out through the artist. That's, I mean, no art, artworks are made without a, a pure form of energy coming through the artist. I really feel like we're a conduit anyway to another world. Uh, the artist is just the vehicle. If you can take yourself out of the process, the more you can get yourself out of the process, the better it is. It's, it, it becomes a purer piece. So I try to, you know, it's a constant discipline to let things happen and don't think. What is your thought process as you're doing this? What do you usually think? I'm uh, focusing on, you know, creating energy off the colors, uh, you know, how they exist next to each other. But I'm also looking, I'm not trying to create consciously anything, but I'm trying to just unleash the organic shapes. So they start to grow and grow. They're almost uh, morphing into another world. And I, you know, I'm a big believer that, that it, 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 you know, that's a world that it could exist in the quantum field. It could be, it could be sent to the artist. It's, you know, it's something that you don't readily hear about. I'm not pursuing an ism or style or name matter. I'm just, I'm just trying to release as much possible force and energy which comes through the color and shape, but with no, no intent to create something recognizable but it, it, it takes over and to the point where you're not even thinking that's that maybe that's what I'm trying to say more you shouldn't have to think you just have to do so each if each individual artist approaches their work kind of in the same way each work's going to be unique because of the way the artist innately thinks and releases ideas into the physical world because we are a conduit between this world and the one between our ears that's getting messages daily. And, and, and particularly when in the art making process. You know, it, it, uh, may somebody, you know, if somebody were to hear that, they say, oh, well, this guy's crazy. You know, what's he talking about? <laughs>